Another main point in this module is this, to pull your people back on mission. Don't, don't see filling the building as your end goal. Send people back on mission, back into the community with the resources of your church. Now, remember earlier we highlighted the process like this. People are all in the community. We want to go out there where they are. Uh, they at some point connect. Uh, some of the people who are connected become part of the congregation. Some of the people who are in the congregation become part of the committed people. Some of the people who are committed become part of the core. And we define what each of those mean in our unique context. And we define objective metrics that show them moving from one to the next. And how do they do it? Do they need to take a class or do they need to, they're serving in some capacity? Or Now notice what happens when they get to that core is boom. We send them back out into the community. By the time they reach the core, we've affirmed that they don't really need us anymore. They are fully developed disciples. They are mature. And we're also affirming, hey, God might have sent them to us because we need them to serve in some way here with what we're doing. He might have also sent them to us because they need us to serve them and help them with what they're doing, with their unique call, their unique mission. You see? Now, a couple observations about that process. Number one, people want to know the next best step. They don't want to be controlled. They don't want to be forced, but they do want to be shown what now. What's next? Um, my experience with leadership has been this. People will forgive you for making mistakes, and they'll likely embrace you because they see you're normal. You know, you, you get up on stage and go, man, I thought that would work. It didn't. It bombed. They'll, they'll okay, no problem. You're, you're human. None of us are perfect. But they will not forgive. That might sound harsh right there. Uh, maybe I need a softer word, but the lack of clarity is the problem. If you're not clear, it's almost like you're using insider language and all that gibberish that that ministry was doing that I told you about earlier. If you're not clear, they'll find and follow the clearest, most concise voice, meaning you might have a phenomenal discipleship framework in your mind, but you're afraid to kind of outline the path and show them, go this, then this, then that, then that, then that. Ah, uh, you know, it might be a great path, but if if you don't show them or if it's confusing the way you're communicating it, they'll find a place where it's clear. Observation number two is the tool you use or create needs to fit with your culture, with really the tone and the environment that you're setting. So don't just import something on top of it. Now, this has been something that I've seen a lot of over the last couple of years, particularly in spurts. Uh, in the early 2000s, what I saw was every church implementing Rick Warren's go around the bases, base one, base two, base three, base four, the exact precise strategy he was using at Saddleback Church that they used to grow it. It is a phenomenal framework. And I'm nothing negative to say about the framework at all. I'm just saying you don't want to just artificially import something on your context. So they were using the graphics. They were using the slick sounding phrases. And in some degree, it just didn't fit the culture of their church. So it didn't work. The reason it didn't work is not because the framework's bad or because it didn't work at all. It just maybe needed to be adapted instead of artificially imported. Uh, you see a lot of churches now using the growth track that the ARC churches, the Association of Related Churches, have been using. And I would say this, most churches are not getting the results that the lead churches in the ARC got with that. And it may be not that the tool is bad, uh, because it's not. It's an incredible tool that obviously is getting results in certain places, phenomenally so. It may be that the tool just needs to be edited and adapted into your unique context. That doesn't mean you got to reemit the will. It doesn't mean you got to scrap. It doesn't mean you got to throw it out. You just got to make some stuff fit with your people, with where you are. 
In other words, the principles can be the same, but how you lead a church in, uh, let's just make up some places. Uh, how you lead it in inner city New York is going to be very different than how you lead it where I live in Birmingham, Alabama. That's going to be very different than how you lead it in Orlando, Florida, which is different than Dallas, which is different than California, which is different than Idaho or New Mexico or Montana. You see, it, it depends on where you are. And with all of those, it depends on if you are in the country or if you're in the city, if you're in a suburb, that changes the presentation. So you can create it, you can adapt it. Here's what I'm saying is don't just artificially lay it on and go, oh, I got it. Think a little bit more intentionally about it. Don't just import something. Observation number three, the path needs to be simple to understand, and it needs to work for the average person who gives it an honest try. Two things there. People have to be able to comprehend it. They've got to understand it. And the path needs to actually have the given proven results for the person who's not a theologian, not a seminarian, doesn't have, you know, hours and hours and months to do this. It needs to work for the average person who takes a shot at it. Uh, let me tell you what I mean. I was having coffee uh, one day with a guy. Josh Canizero, uh was working at Starbucks for a couple years while he attended Highlands here in Birmingham, Alabama, Church of the Highlands. At some point, he took over the growth track. Now he has left back to his home city in New Orleans and leads a church there. He is the guy that took the growth track and put it in the form that closely resembles what it is today. Josh is uh, he's about my age. So when he did this, he was pretty young. He took it from a 15-week class and made it a four-week course. I asked him while we were having coffee, of all places, at a Starbucks, long after he'd worked there. I said, man, how did you decide to change that? And what was the instigating factor behind it? Where you just go, hmm, I'm going to make this from 15 weeks to four weeks. Here's what he said. Well, Starbucks is a multi-million dollar business at each location. And at each location, they take kids uh, and young adults, you know, like, like me, who know absolutely nothing about coffee, nothing about the business model. And within just a few short days of training, they give us the keys to the register, basically, and say, take it and run. And then within just a little bit after that, some of us, they give keys to the store. And like, we're running the place. And he said, so if you do that with coffee and trust kids that quick with a million dollar business, how much more readily could you trust people in the house of God? That's their house who have the spirit of God and release them into ministry. You know, people don't need to know everything about everything about everything about everything to get started. I mean, that discipleship thing is going to be an ongoing process. But what we need to do is create something that gets them a jump start and moves them along in the right direction. Okay, so like uh, I know several minutes ago, I referenced a church where I was doing some consulting, and they had four different classes. They had a 101, effectively, course, four weeks, a 201, a 301, a 401. They, they didn't do a 16-week. A, a lot of people went through first four, they're done. That's it. Now they're serving in ministry. A lot of people decided they want to lead a small group. They went into four more weeks of pastoral training. A lot of people wanted to lead at a higher level. They went through the different three, four-week class and the fourth, four-week class and all of that. You need to create a path that is simple, that people can understand, that works for the average person. Here's another thing. Not only do they need to be able to do it. They need to be able to explain it or it's too complex. And if they won't be able to uh, think about it like this. The truth is, if they can't say it, they can't do it. So it's got to be doable, but it's also got to be sayable when they're not doing it. They, they got to be able to put it in their own language. Uh, let me give you an example. P people can't explain Rick Warren's basis. If, if you grew up 
kind of during that era when Saddleback was getting started and he writes the purpose driven church, people could explain this graphic. I start off at home base. I get to know Christ. I commit to membership. And then I grow in Christ and I commit to maturity. And then I'm trained in Christ. I commit to ministry. And then I go to home plate. I commit to missions and I'm back off the field into another field doing something. Like people can explain that. People can explain 101, 201, 301, 401. Uh, this past year, I had the privilege to help a friend, Kent Maddox, with this. This is his discipleship framework, transformation. It is a four-part pathway. People can explain identity. I discover who God uniquely made me to be. Alignment. I reorder my most valuable assets, time and money. Three, empowerment. I take the presence of God with me everywhere I go because he's with me. Uh, number four, I have a unique assignment just to bless the people that God places right before me. Everybody can understand that. That's a unique path. Most people, after hearing it just a few times, can work through that sequence verbally. Identity, okay, alignment, empowerment, assignment. Identity, alignment, empowerment, assignment. And then they can say what each of those mean in their own words. A life lift. Uh, I'll put a link down to this below as well. Life with is a study to find and fulfill your purpose. This is something that my dad wrote 25 plus years ago. And then I rewrote it over the last few years and developed it into a book and a course and some other resources. Here's, here's the three that he said are essential for you to really zero in what God has placed you on this planet to do. He said, for all of us, there are elements of instructional obedience. That's the things that God has clearly said in the scripture. Some of them, yep, absolutely are in, open to interpretation, but we all need to act on what he has already clearly said for us to do. And then your natural talents and design. There are things that are unique to you because of how you were born your first physical birth, meaning your personality, some of the skills that you have that you excel in, some of your life experiences, all of those occur. And yeah, you could say, well, some's nature, some's nurture. That's true. But it's all as a result of your physical first birth. And so that means that the instructional obedience thing gets a little narrow because we all kind of, you know, the instructional obedience is very similar for us. Some variation, but similar. Uh, natural talents and design. Oh, that's where we really start getting uh, unique. And then you look at those supernatural gifts where God has empowered you through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do something and perform an action or activity at the level of heaven to build up the body of Christ, to achieve God's purposes on the planet Earth. Oh, that's like really super unique for all of us. And when you start aligning all of these, oh man, you find out how you're uniquely wired. Okay, well, most people can remember those three things. What's God told me to do? How did he make me? How did he supernaturally gift me? Got it? Uh, on my website, Jenkins.tv, we really have a discipleship framework that's a lot more robust, but it leads people through simple things, grace, then freedom, then purpose, and then empowerment. What does that mean, grace? We want them to be overcome with what God has done for them to where they're really captured by the essence of forgiveness, freedom, settle the past once for all. Let go of those emotional hurts that get you trapped up and tripped up from walking in your purpose. Discover what you're here for. And then empowerment. Man, move forward. Live it out. Pro tip. If they cannot restate your discipleship path in their own words. So you're, you're not trying to give them necessarily a script, but if they can't say it in their own language, they can't replicate it with their actions. That leads me to number five. You'll need to clearly state your path on your website. So now we're back to the technology uh, because re remember, that's the front door of your church and that's where people go to visit that come to your church to get information. And you're going to need to repeat it from the stage over and over and over and over and over almost ad nauseum. Let me tell you two reasons you got to repeat it like that. Number one, vision leaks. Meaning the longtime members and associates and people that have been around, they forget the vision. They forget the discipleship path. 
they forget because they get busy with life and doing every other thing and serving in the church and in the community and relationships and trials and stuff that just happens. And they don't live with it every day, studying it like you, the leader, do. So it leaks. you got to remind them, hey, this is what we're doing. And here's why we're doing it. And here's the results that we're getting. And then also you got to remember the newest people that come attend your church or go visit your website, they don't know your values unless you tell them. And so you've got to tell them over and over and over and over. And then you got to tell them some more. Observation six. Remember, when you do, you got to go back, boomerang back to what we said in the lessons on websites. Eliminate insider language and acronyms from your vocabulary. Just flush it. Why? Because confused people move on and they don't like to feel stupid. So they're not going to say, hey, I'm confused about what you're trying to do here. They just go somewhere else. Or even worse, they just kind of pause and don't do anything. Seven. Final observation is to find a path that outlines what people do as well as what's unique at each step along the way. And if you do that, they'll walk it out. They want direction so much so that if you don't give it to them, they'll look for direction somewhere else. That means you need a framework, a discipleship framework. The framework for life change always has at least three distinct features. Let me show you what they are, and then I'm going to illustrate it. They have a clear destination. That's the place that you're going to take people. Every framework, a discipleship framework, has a path. That's a route that's guaranteed to take them there, meaning if you do these actions, you take this class, you get this information, you apply these concepts, you're going to arrive at that destination, and there are objective milestones on the way markers that verify and highlight progress towards that goal. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, you got a person here on the left side of the screen. They're here. We want to move them from where they are to where they're designed to be, to live out God's purposes for them. That is what the discipleship pathway, that framework is going to do. There is a clear destination that you articulate what a fully developed disciple looks like in your context at your organization. And then you develop a path that's going to take people there, that's going to work for the average person who gives it an honest try. They're going to be able to articulate it. They're going to be able to say it in their own language. And as they do that, you have specific milestones along the way so that when they hit these, uh, they actually know that they're making progress. It verifies, oh, uh, hey, I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. It gives them mile markers to look back and to see not, not only how far they have left to go, but to verify they're moving in the right direction and to celebrate by looking back the gains that they've made. Oh, I used to be back there, but now I'm up here. So again, clear destination where you take people, a path that will get them there, objective checkpoints along the way. As I close out, here's the last slide, and then I'm going to give you some for further learning. I think that one of the reasons you see a boom of life coaching right now is because life coaches address real issues and they outline paths that the church has better answers to. So if you go sign up to work with the life coach, you're going to get a course and perhaps some one-to-one -one or one-to group interaction, and they're going to clearly spell out a destination they're going to take you. They're going to give you step-by-step -step instructions of, hey, if you walk across this bridge, it's going to get you where you want to be, and they're going to give you some mile markers and celebration checkpoints along the way. The church has better answers for that. And so what I encourage you to do is to step back and to articulate where are you taking people, how do they get there, and what are the objective metrics to where you know people are moving forward from where they are to where they're designed to be. And take it all the way out to the community and bring them into a connection with you, bring them into the congregation, bring them 
into the committed people, bring them into the core, celebrate where they are at each of those points. When What do they do to move from one to the next in their mind? You know, you don't need to tell people in the community, well, you know, you got, you got to be this to be like, just, but spell it out to where you know and to where people can celebrate that at each point along the way.